discernment is uh, one of those very, very important things in our lives. But you don't see discernment. You can't go buy it in the store. You can't, uh, you can't, you can't um, inherit it. You might a little bit genetically if you have parents that were very discerning people. There's a possibility you might get some inheritance there. But, but ultimately, discernment is something that is it's invisible in our lives. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's part of the unseen world. The results of discernment are, can be very visible. And so these next four weeks, we're going to talk about things that we do not see with our eyes, but that are critical to us as individuals. I want you to uh, look at the series scripture, if you grab your handout nearby you there, uh, at the series scripture, and it, and it says this, finally, be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Of the who? You know, uh, some people may not believe the devil is real, but if you turn on the evening news... And look at all the evil around and just even news any place. Um, it, it almost screams at you that there is evil in our world. And the source of that comes uh, from Satan himself. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, against people, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. We live in a fallen world. There's not only God's kingdom present in this world, but there's also another kingdom present in this world, and it's the kingdom of evil. And it, it is powerful. It's frail in comparison to God's power, but because this is the world it operates in, there are times it seems very, very strong, and it is strong, but weak against God's power. Against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. I heard someone say this past week that there have been many times they've, we're talking about standing on the rock, Christ Jesus. There have been many times they have been shaking standing on the rock, but they never stood on the rock and had the rock shake. And so... We, we live in a world that is shaky, a world that, that, that causes us, we, we have a lot of pain, and certainly we can cause our own pain, but we also have a lot of pain that maybe we didn't have anything to do with. It was just circumstances of life, other people. And so I believe this morning, even though most of you would hide this very well uh, on your appearance this morning, I believe that there's an epic battle occurring within each of us. There's one happening inside of you. There's one happening inside of me. And what we're battling within us is our own sinful nature, the pressure of the culture, and Satan himself. Those are three areas of this battle, and those last two play into our sinful nature, that battle that we have within ourselves. And uh, if you heard me say that to, this morning and you're thinking, I have no clue what you're talking about, then there's a chance that that battle is being won in your life. In other words, that you are not even aware that the battle is there. So it's kind of like you're unaware that this is going on. And so in some ways, you've kind of been losing that battle. And so what we have to understand and know is all of us, we know that there are things that are at war within us because of our sinful nature. Sometimes we do desire to do the wrong thing and, uh, and, and, and find ourselves uh, doing things that we'd rather not do. And then also that um, because of wanting to be a part of this, we live in this world, this world is our home, it is our place, and we want to be a part of it, and we should be, this is a place God's given us to live, but... What he has told us not to do is to strongly identify with this world that we neglect to understand that eternity is forever, and this is a time of preparation for eternity. And certainly, most of us here do not embrace evil. We do not embrace Satan in any way. 
But Satan, again, does not come to us with his little red suit and pitchfork. He generally comes to us in a very alluring and enticing manner. And so we're not going to, you know, you're not going to identify him through uh, the cartoons that you've seen about him. You're not going to identify him. He, 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 will, he will be uh, the wolf in sheep's clothing. And so as a result of that, I believe one of our best weapons in this cosmic battle, this epic battle that we face personally, each of us, is discernment. And uh, I want to talk about discernment in kind of a, a very practical and kind of stretch it out a little bit and help us to get a perspective. Number one, discernment is the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not saying that someone who isn't a believer doesn't have any level of discernment. But when we're talking about from the context of Scripture, uh, if you go to the passage of Scripture that talk about the spiritual gifts, the gifts that the Spirit himself imparts to people, uh, one of the spiritual gifts is discernment. Being able to discern between the spirits, being able to discern uh, right and wrong, being able to discern what is, what is morally correct or, or wrong, having that, that spirit. Now, that's a spiritual gift that is given to some people. If it's things that are given a spiritual gift, it does not mean everybody has a spiritual gift of discernment. But I believe God has innately given everybody the ability to see right and wrong. In other words, to be able to discern to some level what is right and wrong. Now, some of that might come from the context of their lives and the basis of the truth that they live their life from. But here's what I want to, to say is, there's no, you might say, well, I don't have the spiritual gift of discernment, and then use that as an excuse to simply live a kind of a, a haphazard spiritual walk or life. And, and, and that, that isn't God's intent for anyone. God's intent is for us all to be discerning. But someone who might have a spiritual gift of discernment may be able to, uh, to discern some things in a little different way, at a little deeper level than others can with regard uh, to, to either in good activity or uh, evil activity. And so let me look at a couple of scriptures here. Psalm 119, uh, verse 66. And if you have noticed, we haven't talked about it too much this year, but if you've noticed on the back of your handouts, um, sometimes separate, but on the back, we've been putting uh, uh, verses from Psalm 119 on the back of your sheet. The reason we've been doing that is because every, it's the longest chapter in the entire Bible. And uh, when, we, when we started that, Till the end, we would be able every week to go through Psalm 119 twice this year. And so uh, to give you an opportunity to see all of the different things that are spoken about God's word, because every verse in Psalm 119 says something about God's law, his word. And so it gives you this, like what I would call tremendously uh, wide range of perspective about what God's word is in what it can do and how it works. And this is one of those verses. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, which is discernment. For I believe in your commandments. One of the ways that the Spirit helps us become discerning people is for us to believe in God's word and to trust it. And through learning his word, to be able to learn good judgment and knowledge. And then in Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, Paul says this, It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. Love is wonderful, but if love is not focused, it, it, it can just be um, syrupy or it can, be, it can be unhealthy. And this is agape love talked about here. It's God's kind of love. It's a love. It's not necessarily a love that's based on reciprocation. It's a love that reflects God's love, it loves people in spite of maybe who they are, what they are, what they're like, what they're doing. But if you don't do that with some knowledge and discernment, you oftentimes can hurt people. And one of the things that uh, you know, Woody has been learning as he's been developing this area of understanding more about missions is that you can go on a mission field and do damage if you're not careful. You can go and, 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 and harm a situation by helping in ways that, that either makes them codependent or it, it takes away their initiative. And so our goal is to really go and help people who are already there doing things do what they're doing better and to encourage them and to love them and pray with them, partner with them, and uh, not just to pour money uh, into it because oftentimes that ends up having a reverse effect uh, on, the, on the mission work there. And so, so we love people 
but we want to do it with knowledge and discernment. We want to love them in the best way, in the most healthy way. We want to love them out of, a, out of a proper understanding and perspective. So discernment's the work of the Spirit. And here's, here's what I want to tell you. Is as you go into Monday morning, that if you invite the Spirit to be your guide through the day, there's going to be times that he's going to caution you on some things. There's going to be times he's going to encourage you towards some things. And it takes experience. It takes time. It takes development to develop this relationship with the Spirit. And it also takes exposing ourselves to God's Word in a regular, ongoing basis to where we begin to see he points us in directions, points us into things, and away from some things in our lives out of the spirit of discernment he's, that, he, that he is working within us. And I don't, you know, there, I'm sure there are a number who have a spirit of discernment as a spiritual gift here today. But everybody has the capability of having spiritual discernment and being able to understand what is right and wrong and what, is, what, is, what, is, uh, what God is saying yes to and what he's saying no to. Number two, discernment is for defensive living. Now, I know just in saying that, there's some of you are going, well, I sure know some people who live pretty defensively. They, they're, they're, they're defensive about everything. You can't say anything to them. You know, they, they're very defensive. Let me explain what I mean by defensive here, okay? Let me give it a context. You, we, there's been a, a, a phrase that's been, um, I guess, become a part of our culture in somewhere, I don't know when it was, but since I've been living, that it became kind of pushed and promoted until finally, I think it's less a part of, we all understand it, we know what it means. It's called defensive driving. Um, if you are a defensive driver, it doesn't mean that you're, uh, you have a bad attitude. It just means you're aware that not everybody out there is as good a driver as you are. Is that not it? And so you, in your driving, you be extra careful. You take caution for them out of deference to them. You don't, want to, you don't want them to be involved in that. Of course, you'd prefer not to also, but you don't want them to be involved in the accident. So you're kind of looking out for yourself and for them. So defensive driving is not a negative thing. It's not a bad thing. It is, uh, it's, it's, actually, it's actually considered to be a very positive thing. Remember to drive defensively. You know, and for those of us in here who love motorcycles, and uh, if you ride a motorcycle, if you don't drive defensively, we'd probably be having your funeral sooner than later. Because you have to always anticipate not only what the other person is doing, but what they might do. You go ahead and assume they will pull out in front of you and they do not see you. You make that assumption. Not because you're judging them wrong, it's just because you understand and know it's a little harder to see a motorcycle, and so as a result, you have to be more defensive in your driving. Um, then, and and I, for, for me personally, I have a whole different set of rules that I use whenever I'm riding a motorcycle uh, than I do for driving a car. Um, and because I'm kind of assuming that if you're on a motorcycle and you get hit by a car or you hit a car, your chances are a whole lot less than theirs are in the car. So, you know, it's, 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 it's Rod's rules in... Uh, in and I, I, try to, I, don't, I try to go by them very, very faithfully if I'm on a motorcycle um, because, because it's, it, it, it can preserve you uh, from death. Um, I believe, how do you do this spiritually? How do, how do you have the kind of discernment that is what we're calling defensive living? Not defensive driving, but defensive living. You're alert, you're aware, you're paying attention to the things that could come into your world, into your life, that would harm you or cause harm to you or to your family. And, and so you, there's some things that you avoid. There are some things that you proactively do. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But in particular, defensive driving is saying you're trying to avoid an accident. There's nothing wrong. I mean, some people take this to an extreme, and they want to you know, go hide in the woods someplace uh, and become so defensive that it's like no risks are involved at all. If you, if, if you, you have, we live in a world where there are risks. We live in a world where things can happen. But the, but the better you are at defensive driving, you lessen the chance of you having an accident. Doesn't mean you won't have one. Doesn't mean I don't think you can, 
go guarantee anybody, you know, you're going to go through life without an accident. And I wouldn't stand here and guarantee anybody you're going to make perfect decisions for your life or for your children's life or for your family's life. I'm not going to say you can make, you can be, you can be a hundred percent accurate on that. I'm not going to say, but I would say this, if you do some defensive living, you will lessen the consequences and the realities and reaping the harvest of bad decisions. Let me just read the scripture to you from 1 John. It says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. So our task as a believer in Christ is to not get so attached to this world and to the things of this world and to pursue just only those things that we lose sight of why we're really here. And, uh, and, and, and so, we, we, as I said, we live in this world, but there's something about this world, and we certainly know that Satan's plan is to kill and destroy. He wants to destroy your family. He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to destroy your children. He wants to destroy everything in your life. That's really his desire. And so one of the ways that we avoid that is not getting caught in the web of living only in the moment, living only for the things around us at any given time, but living for the higher purpose of honoring God with our lives and living in such a way that, that, that yes, we do appropriate, take appropriate measures to take care of ourselves and take care of our family, but we're making sure we don't get tangled in things that would preoccupy us and take us away from the things that God has directed us to do, his will for, his, for our lives, his purpose for our lives. And so many times we get ourselves entangled in things that keep us from being able to fulfill his purpose in our lives. And that's Satan's desire to cripple us, to get us tangled up with things that we shouldn't be tangled up with. And so if you're living a defensive living, then what you're doing is you're watching out for the things that would sidetrack your life. You're looking out for the things that would entrap your life. You're looking out for the things that would cause destruction in your family and in your life. You're, you're paying attention to those things and, uh, and, and, and you're endeavoring to avoid those collisions. You're endeavoring to avoid taking those pathways. And so it's kind of this sense of being alert, being alert, being aware and saying, listen, I know that this looks appealing to me right now, but, it, but, but honestly, it's an entrapment. You know, one of the reasons why we, um, you know, we we've have Tom come up and talk about, you know, financial management a lot. That seems like an odd thing sometimes to throw in a service, um, but for, I mean, for some churches or for some people. Uh, and I know we've been talking about giving here the last little while, and that's, that's a, we don't do tons of that. But I will have to tell you that that's part of our being faithful uh, to each of us to, that we would do that. But, but oftentimes what we're saying is we, what we want you to do is, yes, honor God with the first fruits and be generous with everything else that God has given you. But make sure that you're managing your world well financially because that's part of our responsibility because that's an entanglement that Satan gets us into. And he, and he robs us of the freedom that we have to be able to do the things he wants us to do. And so that's just one area. I can go on and on and on to all the different areas of, of life where Satan tries to entangle us. And it doesn't look like Satan. It doesn't look like, you know, it doesn't look like him. It just looks like stuff and things and people and whatever. But, it, but it's, it's Satan's way of hindering us from living out God's purpose in our lives. So discernment is for defensive living, paying attention to the things that you could collide with in life that will hinder or damage or harm your walk with God and your family. Number three, discernment is for offensive living. Now, before I explain that, some of you are going, well, I've met some of people who live offensively. They, uh, they're offensive about everything. They, in fact, it seems like their goal in life is to offend people. Let me give you the context for this. I'm going to put it in the context of football. If you have a team, and there have been some teams, and I love football, but I'm not, I'm not a diehard fan. I'm what you call fair weather 
football person. You know, if it's, it's more out of convenience, if it just so happens I'm someplace or whatever and there's a big game, a game on, I can get tuned right into it and just have a good time. But I can't tell you who's won the... I can't tell you who's won the championships, the last whatever, and all. I can't give you all. I can't tell you who the greatest, latest players are. I, I, I don't. That's not. That's not stuff I put on my table. I'm not saying anything wrong with it. I'm just saying I don't. I don't tend not to do that. Um, I would say this. I've lived in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, for a few years, and I uh, lived in Florida for a number of years, and now I've lived in Georgia for more years than I've lived any place else, and um, and. Uh, actually lived in Ohio for a few years, so um, and, and and Pennsylvania as well. So I've I've lived near some really really great uh, college football, particularly, and uh, and so you know what? Most of the time, one of those teams somewhere is doing pretty good. So I always feel good about football. I mean, you know, if if you know, because I mean, I know Al- I don't remember exactly what Alabama's done, but I know they've been at the top for a while. You know, we're we're for top for a while. And I uh, think they're going to try to get back there again. So, you know, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm good. You know, Florida team's always in the running. Georgia's somewhere in there making some noise. Uh, I don't know. Is there a South Carolina team? Is there any team in South Carolina? Anyway, I'm just, <laughs> I knew that would rouse a little bit of something. But uh, anyway, um, but that's one thing about living in the Southeast. Uh, you, you know, you, you have some good diehard fans. And uh, I'm not even going to go where you are, Larry. Uh, I'm not even going there. Because uh, he needs to get sanctified or something about that. But, um, but discernment is for offensive living. And offensive living is this. You can have the best defense in the world. And, and you, can, you can keep every team from scoring. But if you don't have an offense, can at least can score one, one, you know, score one time for you. That best offense won't do you any good. You'll still be at zero. You have to live, it has to be an offense in football. You have to have some level of offense. You have to have somebody somehow that can get that ball down into the end zone. It better be a really good kicker or it better be, it better be a, a, a good quarterback or a good running back or a good somebody who can get that football where it needs to go to score some points. And if you have a great defense and e- even a you know, limited offense, it may work. But you have to have an offense. And if you don't have an offense, you may stop a lot of people from doing a lot of things, but you may not get where you need to go. And so offensive living is taking the initiative. Defensive is saying, boy, I'm not going to do this. I see that wreck coming right up there. I'm, I'm going to avoid this. I'm going to, not because you're hiding, not because you're running, but because you're just simply saying, there's some things I'm not going to get entangled with. There's some, I can avoid entanglement there. I can avoid going down that detour. I can avoid this. And so that's, that is uh, be, you know, defensive living. But if offensive living is saying, if I don't take some steps here, if I don't move forward on this, then I, I, I think it's, we're going to be singing the same song in about 10 years from now. And, uh, and, and, and it's, nothing's going to have gone forward. So discernment is for offensive living, seeing what it is that we should be doing and doing that. You know, one of the, one of the I, I, and I'm going to just mention this campaign because uh, there are a couple things about it that are kind of unique. One of them is this. I'm not aware of any church anywhere in the entire United States. It probably has happened. I'm just not aware of it. And I'm not aware of any consulting firm, and we didn't hire a consulting firm on this, but we have, uh, in earlier campaigns, we have certainly tried to learn everything that we could about the best practice, best ways. Anybody that I've ever talked to, ever listened to, ever spoken with, any pastor that's ever done this kind of thing, I've never heard one of them say, now make sure you do your campaign in June and July. In fact, if I were to tell them that we were gonna do it in June and July, all of them would have said, time out, Rod. Do not do this in June and July. And you say, well, then why did you do it? There's only one reason. It's because I felt oppressed from God to do it. And that was affirmed through the leadership of the church. And, uh, and so, so, so we move forward with it. And so what I want to say is this. Sometimes whenever you are endeavoring to live in an offensive way, football technology here, when you're trying to pass the ball down the field, 
it, you know, there, there are sometimes you have to make sure that you have discernment, which means you're hearing from God and you know it. You're not guessing. You're not, you're not blowing smoke. You're not pretending, but you actually know it. And I don't, you know, and what I would say is this. I would say there's going to come a point here in the scripture where you're going to get a chance to, to see this. In fact, it's in this verse. So let's go ahead and read Romans 12 too, which is just a phenomenal verse in and of itself. And verse one, even as phenomenal or more, uh, but this, this, we're going to focus on verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And one of, the, one of the best ways for any Christian, any believer to renew their mind is to know the Scripture, to get familiar with the Scripture. I don't know of any better way than to renew your mind than to get familiar with Scripture. One of the reasons why we pass out the little memory verses every Sunday is because if you, if you were to even memorize one-third of those, that's putting God's word into your heart. And we try to always make them something that is useful, something you can use. Today's, you know, has to do with praying at all times in the spirit. Now, does that mean you walk around mumbling all the time? You know, because we think sometimes, I think we think prayer has to be out loud. And it's okay to pray out loud. And it's a good thing to pray out loud. But it's also important to be in the spirit of prayer. In other words, we, you know, one of the things that, that I've, kind of developed in my own life is this, whenever there is a critical issue or two that I'm concerned about or someone else is concerned about and they've asked me to put that on my prayer list or I felt inclined to do so, I would try to take one or two of those items, what I call with me through the day. And so I, I try to download that into my, into my kind of thinking, my, my capacity to remember, try to download that in there. And as I think of or remember that situation throughout the day, I don't have to even say, now wait just a minute there, what you're saying to me. I have to say a prayer right this very minute. I don't have to stop anybody. I don't have to tell them what I'm doing. Anything else is that thought comes into my mind. I simply might say something like this in my own spirit. God, remember that situation right now. Just reminding God as I'm reminded that there's a concern for the situation. I don't, you know, there are many different ways that you might say praying in the spirit, praying at all times in the spirit is there, but it is, this is a way that I've found that it works for me, is trying to plug some things into my mind that, that and not, not a lot in a day. I mean, maybe at prayer time, if you, have a, if you have a committed prayer time, you can go over an entire list, but I'm not suggesting you take that entire list through the day unless you have a schedule that allows for that, but you take one or two from that list and that are critical things that are on the table now that are, and you, and you make sure that you keep them front and center and you present them to God, you present them to, to him as they come to your mind and a, you can do it in a very, very informal way. Now, let me, uh, let, let me finish this verse. It says, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God what is good and acceptable and perfect. Let me go back and, and, and say this a little differently that I think says it in the way that is best suited from uh, the original language. That having tested, you may discern what is the will of God. In other words, you have, you have looked at God's word, you have seen what God has said, you have tried to understand what he's doing, how he's doing it. You have looked carefully at that. And in consideration of having tested what God has said, you've looked at it and you've, you've examined it. Now you have a clear sense of what is God's will. And, and you say, well, Rod, what if I do explore the scriptures? What if I talk to a couple of people? And at the end of that, I still don't discern what God's will is. The only thing I can tell you on that is push pause. If at all possible, push pause. Because all God is saying to you in that is, is this. He, said, he might be saying no, but it hasn't been clear to you. He might just simply saying time's not right. Hold on. And, and, if, and, and if you look up back up to Ephesians 6, our series scripture, it says, verse 13, therefore take, take on, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. There are some things that only, sometimes the only thing we can do is stand firm. 
And you go, well, what am I going to do? Stand firm the rest of my life? Maybe. Yeah, you're going to stand firm the rest of your life, but you're going to get direction. You will get direction. If you do not have direction, don't make up direction. Don't, don't try, to, try to just randomly make, don't start flipping the coins and doing stuff like that. You'll create all kinds of mess. Hold steady. After having tested what God has to say, you may discern what is the will of God. You will discern it. You may have to wait a little bit for that discernment. And, there's, and, and that's hard on us because we live in a microwave you know, culture and we want it now. And so discernment is for offensive living. And, and what I mean by that is it's for getting a pretty clear, clear picture of what your next move is what your next step is. Now, we know in the big picture of things, you know, we got, this, we got big decisions. Sometimes, you know, it's, you have a, you have a big decision about, you know, how many children are we going to have? You have a big decision, and maybe even about having children, and then how many children are we going to have? Big decision about getting married. Who am I going to marry? You know, who, who will put up with me or who, anyway, all that, I don't need to get into that. Uh, and and, and uh, then big decisions about where are we going to live? What kind of career are we going to have? What, what is, you know, all these big decisions, there are a bunch of big decisions, but those big decisions don't happen every day. Those are, those are, those come along. And so those certainly are critical for us to live offensively, to understand and know what God's next step is for us. But I believe God wants us to live offensively in the context of football offense um, every day of our lives, looking for opportunities to do good and doing it looking for opportunities to advance our growth and understanding of who God is and how he works, building stronger relationships with those we love, opportunities to advance God's kingdom, opportunities to say yes to someone in need, opportunities. God will give us those opportunities. We can take steps forward. We can move the ball down the field, so to speak, in our spiritual life. And the best way that we can do that is by discerning what is God's plan, what is his will for our lives. And I know oftentimes people, I have no idea what it is. Well, just do what you do know. Don't worry about that big thing out there. Don't worry about being Billy Graham. You know, don't worry about uh, being, the, being the next you know, uh, coolest, smartest, whatever. Don't worry about that. Just do the next thing you can do. Um, if you've noticed this, that uh, there are times whenever someone catches the kick and they run it all the way back down into the opposite end zone. Now, those are like fun. I mean, if you get to watch a game and you see that, that's fun, especially if your team is running the ball. I mean, that's like really, really fun. But do you know that most of the time they move that ball down the field by a couple yards at a time, a few yards at a time? And there are plenty of times they moved it down the field, but they didn't get enough, so they end up having to kick it back down and try again and try again and try again. There's a lot of setbacks. We have to learn to remember life is full of setbacks, but God will help us move the ball down the field. Number four, discernment is for your benefit rather than an excuse to judge others. Maybe I just ought to read that one more time. Discernment is for your benefit rather than an excuse to judge others. Now, truthfully, you cannot have discernment without some level of making some judgments about other people. In other words, someone may want to be your best friend and, uh, and they, they may want to, you know, they think they're going to hang with you all the time or something like that. And there's just something in your spirit that says, you know, I, I, I appreciate that and I'll be friends, I'll be friendly or whatever, but, you know, but I'm not going to spend three days a week with you or I'm not going to, you don't have to say that out loud, but I'm saying, you know, we're always, we, we're people who have bad character, people who have good character. And what, what I think is important to understand is that as we discern those things, we don't judge people by them. In other words, we may discern that in our own spirit, but it's not for you to declare. Here, here's what I've come to find out about this issue of, of judging, and that is this, that I have a hard enough time accurately judging myself. So who do I think I am that I would be able to accurately judge you and your motives? It's, 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 that's too hard. Now, you, you might say, well, Rod, don't you think there are times when you just really know? Yeah, probably. There probably are some times where I'm thinking, yeah, I, I, I think I have that figured out. But it still doesn't mean that I have to go proclaim it to everybody that I know and say, 
that's a born loser over there, or that's, you know, whatever it is that you've determined they are. You don't have to, you don't have to announce it. You, you, see, discernment is for you to make good choices about how you live your life. Discernment is for you to find people who are doing what they're doing in life better than you are and learn from them. Discernment is realizing and understanding whenever this is a person who is behind me in this area and it seems like a person I can help, I can encourage, I can draw them forward. I can be an influence in their lives. See, God wants us to always be reaching forward to people who are ahead of us and learning and growing from them. He also wants us to reach back here, not in a reaching down and putting people down, but in a way of helping people come to where we are. If you don't have some people that are ahead of you that you're seeking wisdom and guidance from, then you're just up to your best guess. And, and I've found that God, one of the ways God works in, in, in my life is through the wisdom of other people. Now, that doesn't mean they get to dictate or tell me what to do or how to do it and when to do it and all that. It just simply means I can grow and learn from them. Sometimes that can be from a book. Sometimes that's often it's great if it can be from a person. And, uh, and, and, and I think we just have to make sure we understand we're endeavoring to learn from their success and their, the place they are in life and understand how God would apply that knowledge into our lives. Then we also impart to other people not in a, you know, stand above, look down at them position, but in a reach down and, and help them hold their hands and come along. And either of those can become unhealthy if we're not careful. And so what we have to do is make sure that in our observation, our judgment of other people and how they interact and who they are into our lives or not, that we're not judgmental of them but we become discerning for how that works. But that's true not only of people, it's true of every area of our lives, that we become discerning about every aspect of our lives and say, is this, is this, is this something that would honor God? Is this something that demonstrates wisdom? Is this something that is just of the moment that if I two weeks from now came back to, it wouldn't matter, but I'll go ahead and you know, make a rash decision now and jump into it. So discernment is for your benefit. God gave you discernment so that you would know right from wrong. He gave you discernment so you would know how to seek out help from the right people. He gave you discernment so you'd know how to give help to the right people. And, 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 and so it's critical for us to develop discernment in our lives. In us, and, and the two most significant ways to do that happen to be by God's spirit, making God's spirit more and more at home in our lives and opening the scriptures and reading. And then appropriate wisdom from those that we trust. Number five, discernment particularly, and there's three things here that I want to point out, reveal, that reveal our motives. Uh, here's, here's, here's what uh, discernment does. Discernment allows you to look inside of yourself and judge yourself, not in a condemning way, but in a, in a healthy perspective where you're going, I'm embracing things I shouldn't be embracing. I'm not pursuing things I should be pursuing, or to, to yes, I am approving the things I should be approving, or I am choosing not to embrace things that would be harmful. It reveals our motive. What is our motive? Because that's the hardest thing for us to get a hold of. And understand that's really what God looks at. When God looks at us, he's not, he, you know, he may appreciate the fact that you dressed up and come to church this morning and you look nice. I mean, he, you know, I'm sure he'd prefer that than for you to come in like a scumbag. But I can tell you this, what God's really looking at when he looks at you is the motivation of your heart. That's what he's looking at. That's what he's looking at in my life. That's what he's looking at in your life. And so the, the hardest questions that I ever ask myself are related to my motives, my motives and how I treat people, my motives and how I treat my kids, my motives and how I treat my wife, my, my motives and how I, I treat coworkers, my motives in every area. What is, I want to know what my motive is. Because if my motive is off, it really, really takes you on a ride you don't want to go on. And so having that right motive comes, and, and being able to, to clarify that, comes from discernment. We have to be able to discern our motivation and discernment helps us be able to do that. It reveals, true discernment will reveal your motives. The second one, discernment particularly directs our choices. 
We talked about the things we embrace offensively, living offensively, living defensively, the things we choose to avoid. That's where that comes in. It's, it's, discernment helps us to be clear about our yeses and to be clear about our noes. Discernment gives us clarity there. And you say, is there not any gray area? Sure, there's gray area. But if it's critical, important, it will become a yes or no. There are some things that don't matter. You know, it, it, it really, um, this is one benefit I have of parenting the second time around is, uh, you know, every once in a while, you know, Skylar, she likes to uh, put on, like, she likes to put on different color socks. Well, when I first saw her doing that, you know, like, I mean, still matched her outfit, but there were two different color socks. And I'm like, Go get some socks on. Or, well, I have socks on. That's what she wanted to wear. And so I made a big deal about it. Then I thought, you know what? Does that really matter? Nope. And so I said, let's go. Let's go. So now I smile when I see her with two different, you know, I'm not saying there isn't an appropriate time not to do that, but it's just, you know, that was just like her being her, you know, and it's like she thought that was cool to do, and so she did it. And I don't know, she probably saw your kid doing it. Not, anyway, but um, so um, that's one thing good about being a pastor, too. You can blame everybody else for how your kids turn out. So, um, and I know, don't worry, it works the other way, too. Um, well, they were around the pastor's kids, and that's a... Uh, It directs our choices. If you find yourself having a hard time making good choices in life, I will have to tell you it probably is because you have not developed this muscle called discernment. Discernment will give you clarity on your yeses and noes. Discernment particularly develops our effectiveness. The more discernment you have, the better you are at relationships. The more discernment you have, the better you are emotionally as a person. It clears up the muck. When you exercise discipline of, of, of developing this area of discernment, it makes you a healthier person emotionally. Financially, it will, it will make you more effective financially. You will be more discerning. Spiritually, without a doubt, it can turn your life around this area of discernment because it heightens our walk with the Spirit. And whenever you're turned into the walk with the Spirit, I'm just going to tell you, you get back to 2020 vision, is what you do spiritually. Hebrews 4:12, and here is just the recipe for this, okay? For the Word of God is what? Living. And what? Sharper than any two-edged what? Piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow. And what? Discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So, if you refuse to camp out in God's word at all, or refuse to embrace the spirit, it's going to be really hard to develop true discernment. If you will do those things, you'll begin down a pathway that will lead to great clarity in your life because your discernment will work.